happy holidays. This is the Soundtrack Your Life Christmas special. So I am Ryan Peck. And I'm Nicole Barlow. We're going to talk about one of our favorite Christmas specials of all time. One that just got re-released on YouTube in pristine, stunning high definition. And uh, I just showed it to my daughter the other day and she loved it. Oh, did she love it? She did. That makes that warms my heart. I guess we should say what it is. So today we're going to talk about the 1988 primetime TV special, also Emmy nominated, Christmas at Pee Wee's Playhouse. Which is my personal favorite piece of holiday media. It just holds a very special place in my heart. It is my Christmas Eve tradition. Every year on Christmas Eve, I wait because everybody has movies at the holidays that I think they wait to watch. You kind of bank them for late. I wait until Christmas Eve. I queue it up. I have it on DVD because for a while it wasn't really accessible any other way. Um, I have it on DVD. I queue it up. I wrap all my presents. I make hot toddies. And I just get like, you know, like progressively more drunk on hot toddies. And this the special gets like better as the hot <laughs> toddies. <laughs> it. Cause it's bonkers. It's it's insane. It is insane. <laughs> especially because it was on CBS at eight PM in yeah. nineteen eighty eight. Yeah. Do you remember it from its original run? Like, I, I mean, we were like similar ages. So like, do you remember it as a kid, seeing it as a kid? Yeah. I mean, I think I haven't really seen it since I was a kid. Oh, wow. I believe I had it on VHS and I remember like burning a hole through it. Yeah. I mean, the, well, Pee Wee's Playhouse and also this special, I feel like have been a fixture in my life for so long. Paul Rubin's passed this year, um, as we all know. And man, you know how some celebrity deaths just impact you in a way that the others don't like it, it hit hard because the, 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 he's just like an, he's an icon. He's a hero. He's a childhood hero. Everything that he's ever made is so perfectly unique. So camp, so fun. This special is, is no exception. The special gives you everything you want and then triples down. Yeah, this special literally does not waste a single moment of time. No. Uh -uh. Mm -mm. No wasted frames. And and it's short. I don't know what the runtime is, but it's pretty short, right? Yeah, it's like 48 minutes, like basically an hour special with commercials. Right. So it's it's an hour special with commercials. It's short. And you would think that, um, you know, I don't know, a lot of holiday specials, there's just so much filler, even if they're short. There is no filler. Um, it, it opens strong, it closes strong. And in the middle you get like share, you get Grace Jones popping out of a box to sing little drummer boy. You get everything. <laughs> yeah. I was reading a vulture article on, on the Pee Wee special and they were discussing how at the beginning where, you know, he says that there's all these celebrities being that, that all these celebrities were going to be on the special you almost think it's a joke because it's so jam packed of like big names. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, like there's Annette Funicello and Frankie Avalon. Okay, there's Grace Jones. Okay, here comes Cher. Okay, here comes Little Richard. And they're just like rapid fire succession of like crazy 80s celebrities. It's crazy how many people. And w- what's really charming, and um, by all accounts, Paul Rubens was a, a gentleman, a really nice guy. Um, really beloved. And he wrote letters to a bunch of celebrities that he wanted to have on the show. And I'm sure they were great letters. And these are the people that said, yeah, sure, I'll come to Pee Wee's Playhouse, which I think is a testament to like peak fame Pee Wee and how much people really wanted to be a part of that. Oprah is on this fucking special. Oprah has a cameo. Peak Oprah. Joan Rivers too. Joan Rivers. Everyone. It's kind of like think of like all the characters that you would see like in a like a steakhouse or something like it. Everybody is in this in this damn special. It's crazy. Yeah. And you have 
full musical performances. You have Grace Jones, as you mentioned, who I hadn't, I had no idea who Grace Jones was no in 1980. Idea. No, young me was like, who is that? It's like, she kind of looks like she's like a pharaoh. Well, she comes, okay, so the scene is, if you haven't seen it, Grace Jones, this giant box arrives at Pee Wee's Playhouse. He's receiving all these gifts, right? That's kind of like the structure of the show is him like learning about Christmas and putting together his Christmas list. Giant box arrives, wooden crate arrives, they roll it into the playhouse and out pops Grace Jones in this like Pharaoh's hat, headgear, and then kind of this like really sick, like molded, like titty bodysuit. And then she just starts to sing Little Drummer Boy. And and not like a Christmas version of it, just like a straight up Grace Jones rendition of Little Drummer Boy. It's amazing. It's fabulous. And then they realize that she was supposed to get sent to the White House and not the Playhouse. <laughs> yes, that's the gag. Like that's the whole gag. And then it ends. And then she goes away and you never see her again. And it's great. It's the most bonkers version of Little Drummer Boy next to the Bing Crosby, like David Bowie version. It's very much in that like same league of like, <laughs> I can't believe this happened. Yeah. And so it's like a subversive Christmas special. It's kind of making fun of Christmas specials at the same time. It's showing reverence to Christmas specials. But like, as far as like all these celebrities showing up and like everyone's in on the joke, oh, yeah. except maybe Dinosaur. Except maybe Dinosaur, who they have, uh, he has this, this kind of like phone booth that he uses. He invented Teams. He invented Teams. He's got like a tin can or a string and there's like a phone booth and it's like it's like a Zoom call or a Teams call. And he's even got a background that he pulls yeah! behind him. He has this little like pull down. like <laughs> It's so great. It's such a gag. And then she's on it and then eventually he's like she starts singing 12 Days of Christmas and it's really long when he puts up this like peewee mannequin in the Zoom call. It's great. So good. Yeah, he was on he was on the other line with Oprah, right? Yeah, he was on the line with everybody. All the cameos are like via this um, kind of weird Zoom booth that lives in the playhouse. It's, it's so great. It opens on a song um, that that's written for the show. And it opens on a choir that is supposed to be the Marine Corps choir, but it's not. It's like the it's the men's choir from UCLA, <laughs> which I always find like a really funny factoid. I don't know why they had to make it. I think because it's more camp to make it like. I don't know, a bunch of like military dress dudes <laughs> that break into dance, <laughs> that like break into dance. And there's kind of this like Supremes ask like backup singers. And it's and it's just like a whole extravaganza. I don't know what to, what else to call it. It's an extravaganza. So watching it as an adult for the first time in a really long time. I was surprised that in 1988 that he like it's a very multiracial like cast of characters yes yes it is um i feel and i have always felt that the Wee's playhouse environment that the world that they create it's kind of this utopian multicultural um accepting safe place that's how it always felt to me growing up, actually. And that I always felt like, okay, well, you can be just as, as you can be who you are in the playhouse. And that's okay. That's fine. And I think that's kind of the point of the show. And it, and it is exceptionally camp and exceptionally gay. And I feel like if we didn't talk about that, like it w- we would be missing the point because it, re- I mean, it really fucking is. It's just so over the top. <laughs> it's so camp. Yes, <laughs> that that was also brought up in the Vulture uh, article that I was reading is just like, it's an extremely queer special. Ex- like extremely, like it's it's a quintessential piece of like queer media. And like maybe, I don't know, maybe like the only piece of like queer holiday like entertainment that you can like really point to as being like iconic in the way that it is. I mean, Charo comes out at one point and sings Feliz Navidad <laughs> and does like the coochie coochie shit. It's amazing. That is where I learned that song. I, me too. I never heard it before that. And I was obsessed with her. Yeah. Obsessed. So it was probably after uh, Zoe was born, you know, we would play different christmas songs 
and Feliz Navidad would come on and I would sing along and I would roll my R's on Merry Christmas. And, <laughs> you know, and it confused Eunice because like the original recording doesn't have the rolling of the R's. And she's like, why do you sing it like that? And I said, because I watched Charo do it on Pee Wee's Christmas special. Well, honestly, I thought that was the only way to sing it, too. Maybe, I mean, maybe it is. I think it's the definitive version, <laughs> if nothing else. So I get it. I get where you're coming from. I don't think Eunice has ever seen it. So we were watching it together as a family. And um, the the cow... Gets the gift from Pee Wee. He gives her new bell. I feel bad that I don't know the cow's name off the top of my head. Okay. And then the cow goes, "Oh, Zsa Zsa," and Zsa Zsa Gabor shows up right and through the window, like right by the, the window, window. Yeah. window. And Eunice goes, "That's Zsa Zsa Gabor. That's not Charo." And I said, <laughs> "No, Charo's still coming." And that's the thing is that. You know, you think like how many gay icons can you pack into one special um, and then suddenly you get Little Richard, right? Like that's kind of it's just the gift that keeps giving. It's like an everlasting gobstopper of just like camp. Cher is in it. Like it's crazy. Katie Lang shows up and has a moment. Um, <laughs> why am I blinking on the song that Katie Lang sings? Because it's so unhinged. Because it sounds like she's doing some Italian bit, like, what's the matter, what's the matter? But it isn't. It's like, <laughs> now I'm, like, blanking on what she sings. We have to, we have to find it. <laughs> it's like it, White Christmas or something crazy, but it doesn't no, sound... No, it's like Jingle Bell Rock or something. Is it Jingle Bell Rock? It's something classic, but, like, she is so unhinged. Jingle Bell Rock, yes. Okay, so Katie Lane comes out in... The worst, just the craziest looking kind of Western shoulder padded, uh, like dr skirt dress, like dr like a suit, but also a dress, it's like a nudie suit, but it's a dress and it's from the 90s, like early, late, late 80s, early 90s. It's got these, like, <laughs> like she got it from pads. the future. <laughs> like, no, but it's, it's just the most, it's the most heinous looking garment. And then she proceeds to just like absolutely go jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. She's got like all kinds of flourishes. Like she's all over the place in this song. Like she definitely did like several lines. She was, she was, there was snow that day at the, play, at the playhouse is what I'm saying. And the performance that she does on screen matches the vocal performance. Like she's flailing and flopping and the jazz band puppets are there. Uh, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's I, I feel, you know, I don't know if they shot this in order, but it feels like everyone's trying to one up each other, or at least enthusiasm wise. It just seems like the energy just keeps on going up and up and up and up and up. I mean, while Charo's singing Feliz Navidad, he's trying to hit a pinata with a stick. Right. No, you're right. That does happen. Well, I think it's just because the energy is so manic throughout and it's just like a sustained manic energy first because it's a kid's show for all intents and purposes it's a, it's a kid's show it's a children's show right and there everything is completely above board and appropriate for children like obviously we all watched it on primetime tv on cbs but it's also just completely <laughs> unhinged my i think my favorite one of my favorite like musical things about this is the the del rubio triplets and the Del Rubio triplets are like by the time of this special in 1989, they're probably, you know, in their late 60s, right? And they're like these three singing sisters with their guitars and their little matching outfits. Uh, and it's just so weird. <laughs> like it makes you feel like you're on drugs, which I guess is kind of like it's kind of it really does capture like how you feel as a little kid. It's like you're on like a sugar high, right? Like you've eaten like way too many candy canes and now you're hallucinating stuff and three women have multiplied and they're singing winter wonderland yeah and they're just kind of like walking with their guitars and it's great so crazy and then the idea for Heim was born <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly frankie avalon and annette funicello are in the 
playhouse with with Pee Wee, and they're making Christmas cards. And <laughs> there's this running joke of Pee Wee basically like working them like uh, I don't know. He, he he's he's uh, definitely he's he's asked them to make one thousand total Christmas cards for him, and. For some reason, I thought there was going to be like a just kidding at the end of the episode, but it never comes. But he never <laughs> explains why he needs them. No, because nothing is explained. And then uh, they ask for food and water. And he literally gives them or he something to drink and something to eat. And he literally gives them uh, bread and water. Bread and water. Yeah, because they're they're prisoners. They're essentially his like indentured servants that are making cards for no one and they make like the cards with the like carved out potato they're supposed to be sort of like crafting tips right. but they're like stupid and you actually do it. yeah <laughs> let's let's make cards in the most convoluted way possible let's the, carve a, a that, candy cane shape in a potato right let's make cards in a way that no one in their right mind would ever make them that seems fun. Yeah, I think I think one of my other favorite parts is again. There's a lot of musicians in this. Like Cher is in it, but she doesn't get a musical number. Um, Little Richard shows up at one point, uh, and the, the like. Well, the precursor for this, if I'm remembering it right, is um, Pee Wee is on this kind of like green screen, <laughs> on this green screen like sled trip with Magic Johnson. When I say it out loud, it sounds like I'm making it it's up. A like, it's a snowmobile. Like it's a but- snowmobile, I believe. Snowmobile. Okay. So I'm like, is it motorized or is it not? So he's on a snowmobile. Or is with he on Matt a slide? He's on something. Yeah. Something, something wintry, some kind of escapade with Magic Johnson. Uh, and they're like kind of shown in profile and they're like, you know, Matterhorn, like bobsled writing on this thing. And then they end up at a frozen lake and the frozen lake where Pee Wee goes ice skating um, with a body double that's like a professional finger skater pretending to be him. Little Richard is there, like just at this for no reason. There's no reason for him to be there. And he's got that old school like ice pack yes. tied around his back. <laughs> like the hot water bottle or whatever. <laughs> and then at one point he falls down, right? And everything little Richard ever did in his life was like a dramatic diva moment. And I read a thing where like apparently he asked the director, like, do you want me to scream like a man or scream like a woman? <laughs> So I guess you can like make your own judgment call on like which one little Richard went with. But another legend on the the Pee Wee special. Like how many icons can you fit like just musically into one special? You have Grace Jones, you have little Richard, you have Cher, you have Katie Lang. Like that's already a pretty stacked house. And it's all like in a holiday setting. Which makes no sense, but also makes perfect sense. It makes sense because Pee Wee wanted it to make sense. Exactly, because you're just living in you're living in Pee Wee's world. So, within this Christmas special, they they do give a moment to explain Hanukkah, right? With Miss Yvonne. No, no, with Mrs. Renee. With Mrs. Renee, sorry, I get them confused, and I shouldn't. Miss Yvonne is the uh, one that always hits on Pee Wee with the big hair. Yes, yes. Anyway, go on. And so this is where I learned the dreidel song. Yeah. Because I, I guess at, at this point in my life, I probably maybe didn't have any Jewish friends. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. I think depending on um, you know where you, where you grew up, right? That wasn't always a given. I think because of the special, I assumed every dreidel had chocolates in it. Yeah. You know, I think, <laughs> I think it gave all of us a lot of expectations about holiday traditions that maybe weren't <laughs> completely accurate. Dinosaurs are Jewish. Well, I always appreciated that though. I'm like, oh, cool. They made the dinosaurs that live in the hole in the wall Jewish. All right. That works. Good for them. Uh, one thing that this Vulture article pointed out that I thought was uh, really poignant was he has that little moment with Randy, the puppet, about Christmas. And Randy's complaining about how it's, you know, this commercial guilt. And and then they watch a video about, like, the birth of the baby Jesus. And this, right. vul- and this Vulture article um, 
points out Paul Rubens is Jewish. Well, you honestly, you could kind of tell that there was something network happening, network involvement happening where they get this like it's literally like a, a film strip clip from the 1960s of what the baby Jesus is. And it lasts for about 30 seconds. And then they just go back to doing a bunch of damn shit. <laughs> like it's not. They do not linger on Christmas. No. They no. just let they just let the magic screen like do a little thing and then you're like out. Speaking of Hanukkah, I don't know if you this is not related to anything, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Have you seen that video that's going around of Smokey Robinson on Cameo? Mm-mm. Where apparently somebody somebody asked Smokey Robinson to wish their friend like a happy Hanukkah, but he didn't understand the spelling. So he's like, I would just like to wish you happy Chinooka. I don't know what Chinooka is, <laughs> but happy Chinooka and hope you enjoy your Chinooka. <laughs> and it's the greatest thing ever. I feel like Smokey Robinson and his Chinooka would have fit right in in this Christmas. Yeah, I was about to say that would be in the uh, POE 2023 version. Felt very bad. But not it's very scripted. funny. I'm going to send it to you. Right. I-, I can't wait to see it. I remember as a kid, I loved the cartoon that they play in the middle of the episode um, where indentured servant Annette Finicello gets to press the button from the King of Cartoons. King of Cartoons, yeah. It's and, it's, and it's like the there's like an orphanage. <laughs> and this guy, I don't know if he works at the orphanage, but this old man <laughs> climbs through the window and just starts making toys out of whatever crap they have. <laughs> and it's like a very sweet cartoon like it's it's fun and it's funny like it's not like overly sappy but he's like oh. making a christmas tree out of like a bunch of umbrellas and he's spitting nails into some makeshift sled that he's making and there, there's a little choo-choo train that's being powered by a coffee pot <laughs> but i just remember loving that cartoon and i i've never been able to find it outside of the special well, yeah, because they for the King of Cartoon segments, they would pick the most obscure 1930s weirdo cartoons that I don't they're probably not even available anywhere else. They probably pulled them from some like, you know, whatever royalty free cartoon. <laughs> I, I, I had forgotten that was in there. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I used to really like I I think sometimes I would just like rewind the tape just so i could watch that cartoon and then you know just like on like a regular like like a wednesday in the summer be like oh yeah i don't watch that christmas cartoon no totally so it doesn't it doesn't play in the christmas special but if you watched um he was playhouse growing up has a really great opening theme um do you know who sings that opening theme i do not cindy lopper wow which I learned uh, kind of recently, but that's very cool. I think it's an, a, and I think she didn't want credit for it for some reason. So it's kind of like a open secret thing, but he pulled the big names, I guess is what I'm saying. He, he was, it was easy for him to find collaborators, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think people forget that Pee Wee's Big Adventure is directed by Tim Burton. <laughs> Right. And of course, like, you know, all that music being by um, Danny Elfman and stuff and being so iconic and kind of associated with Pee Wee. I feel like there's a there's a long Pee Wee adjacent and related musical legacy um, because he's such an important figure in 80s pop culture. I think my childhood certainly would not have been the same um, in an absence of Pee Wee. And just kind of that, like, permission to be super weird. A lot of those things that you're describing, like the cartoon, I think we all have, we all have those little memory hole things that, like, live with us from that show. Right. <laughs> like, sometimes I'll just think about, um, like, the eye that would blink on his weird helmet when he rode his bike. I don't know why, but it's just kind of, like, seared into my memory. I will never get over... Um... His Christmas list being basically just um, like calculator paper. Like it's just that, <laughs> you know, Conky's just printing out. Right. It's just this big like roll of paper. It's this giant list. <laughs> and everyone keeps bringing him fruitcakes. 
Yes, I did love the fruitcake gag. And it's fueled my my just hatred of my lifelong hatred of fruit fruitcakes. I don't think anybody likes fruitcakes. I think that's an okay thing to admit. Yeah, I mean, he made fun of it because it's true. Because it's true, right? Yeah, Nobody's even, eating that. Even the old people on CBS are like, yeah, I don't like fruitcakes. <laughs> so I was looking up some of... Like what other people from this special have done? Like not, you know, obviously not the celebrities, but you know, like Rita, the male woman, she um, was off also on the Playhouse, but um, she was on a bunch of like Law and Order, like she's a regular on Law and Order. That's funny. Well, Lawrence Fishburne was Larry Cowboy Curtis. Fishburne, yeah, Cowboy yeah. Curtis. So with that atrocious accent, it's <laughs> so bad. <laughs> Cowboy in quotes. <laughs> we weren't even trying. Yeah, to go from that straight into Morpheus. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a lot of range. My husband ran into him at a grocery store in Newport Beach. He's a lot shorter than you would think, apparently. I think the trench coat adds some optical height. Some or optical. the cowboy hat. I, I, yeah, I think there are various accessories that we're used to seeing him in, so we assume that he's tall, but I guess he's not. And I guess on Blackish, they just had him sit on the couch all the time. <laughs> <he's> the grandpa. <laughs> Did your husband call him Cowboy Curtis? <laughs> I think in his head, probably. <laughs> it, would, it would be great if you met Lawrence Fishburne and you're like, not Morpheus, Cowboy Curtis, yeah. right? It would be great. I think the exact reporting was to sell Morpheus in the grocery store. It's memory thirst. Morpheus to you, but Cowboy Curtis to us. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, again, it's just, it's such a long list of people. It's Lawrence Fishburne. It's Jaja Gabor. It's Whoopi Goldberg, which is random. But she's there At, again. Like I think at kind of the height of her fame is probably like post ghost, maybe post. I don't know. She she because she's only like on the phone, so she's big deal at that time. Ghost was nineteen ninety, but okay, J K. But you it know, was ghost. Whoopi Free was ghost. still huge Whoopi. in the eighties. She was a big deal. So I never remember when things are. It's like when was Sister Act? That was later. That was post-act. yeah. But I mean, she had done the color purple and right. Of course, she was a big deal. Joan Rivers is there. Dinah Shore is there. Del Rubio triplets. Charo, Oprah, Little Richard, Katie Lang, Cher, Annette, Magic Johnson, Grace Jones. So many people in like a 40 minute special. And every time I watch it, I'm just kind of like delighted. It has a very delightful quality that it really does feel like you're opening an advent calendar of random 80s. <laughs> like little doors and then just oh. There's the Joan Rivers. Oh, and I do, I do love that she shows up in her Hollywood square. Oh, yeah, that's right. She does. <laughs> Which gives you, like, I think a, that's a good, uh, it's a good way to date this. Yeah, it's like, like a cultural snapshot. Totally. No, it totally is. Like, in a very warped way, but it, it definitely is. Yeah, I read that um, Annette Funicello actually had ms at this point it was just undiagnosed oh wow who was that and then and then it just gets sadder from her imdb page well no but uh you know she looked like really healthy in this in the special yeah no she she does even with her green teeth from the toothbrush right right from the (laughs) tempera paint that they use she brushes her teeth in. Well, that's good stuff. Yeah, it's it's weird because like her heyday was like the fifties, her and Frankie. Okay. And I think the Del Rubio triplets as well. So right. I mean, I think that's part of the reason you feel like you're just like in this, you know, time it's why it feels like a drug trip, right? Because it's like, oh, yeah. you have people from the that were huge in the eighties and huge in the fifties, I guess. And Little Richard was what the seventies. I mean, fifties, right? Like, I feel like one of the original like rock and roll pioneers. Like, Little Richard is also kind of, I feel like, in that cohort of people that 
are very retro 50s, 60s. And there is kind of that weird like astro retro, I don't know, um, like plastic 50s feeling to things too. Right. Um, So yeah, it really does make you, it brings you to a completely different place. You feel a little bit high watching if you're not. Did you know that the uh, king of cartoons is like, he is Blackula. What? Yeah, really? he's. I was wow. like, he looks familiar. And then I was like, I want to see what this guy has done. And he is he is best known for like a bunch of black exploitation films. Wow. Um, including Blackula. That's cool. And that's why it's like, you know, like Pee Wee, like he 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 knew. <laughs> like, you know, he, Yeah. No, totally. Totally. No, well, I feel like both, you know, he and he and Phil Hartman is kind of the the engineers of this show and like the tone of it and the style of it and the people that were on it very much like, you know, steeped in like pop culture. Like they uh, definitely like knew things and put like more thought into what it would be creatively than anyone would put into an average kids show. Yeah. Which is what made it interesting and entertaining. And I think that's what it was kind of those little like um, those little inaccessible things. Like you were saying, like, I didn't know like who Charo was. I didn't know who Grace Jones was. But after that, you kind of want to know, right? Like tickle something in your brain where you're like, oh, right. Wow. I probably shouldn't be what should I be watching this? <laughs> And that's the best feeling ever when you're a kid, when you feel like you're watching something that's kind of slightly illicit. Like, oh, I don't know if this is appropriate for me. So as, so watching it as an adult, there was only one moment where I felt like it was being like a little too <laughs> um, naughty. Which one? <laughs> so it's when Miss Yvonne shows up and she's got the mistletoe. So she, you know, she's like, oh, I've got this mistletoe and this is what it means. And then like everyone's like, come over here, Miss Yvonne, give me a kiss. Yeah. And then Flory goes, come here, Miss Yvonne, give me a kiss. And I'm like, but right. she's wearing a dress. She's wearing a dress, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, is that, not, is that inappropriate? Well, for me, it's the, and forgive me because I can't, I can't remember the exact context of this right now. Again, like I make like four hot toddies and then I watch this every year. So the recall is maybe not what it should be. But there's also that part where like they're doing construction on the place where Pee Wee is going to put his presence. And then you look into the construction pit and just a bunch of like shirtless guys, <laughs> really hunky guys. I, I think that's where they're making the fruitcake wing. Oh, is it the fruitcake wing? That's what it is. Okay. Yeah. I knew that they were making, they were like, they're building onto the playhouse to house something. Right. But it's like shirtless guys or guys in tank tops. No, they're like fully. Oh yeah, they're they like, are shirtless, shirtless. Yeah, no, they're shirtless, like gre- like <laughs> oiled up, like shirtless, like you're supposed to objectify them, like corny looking construction. <laughs> it has no place. And then he hands the fruitcake, and they're just like, oh, "Here's another one." Right, and totally, like it's a it's a lot of things like that, right? <laughs> Which is great. I mean. I love that Paul Rubens was able to get a lot of this stuff past the censors. I like when things were like able to pass through like network censors. And at some point they were just like, yeah, it's this good. No notes. No notes. No changes. You didn't get me another a fruitcake, did you? No, I got you two fruitcakes. Right? Because this also was like fruitcakes. Hello, the fruitcake wing. And there's a bunch of shirtless guys in the fruitcake wing. Like, yeah, okay. We see what you did there. We see what you did. And it's great. But the network sensors are just like, two guys in fruitcake wing. Okay. Because you know there were some, like, executives that were like, we're just way too heterosexual to understand what's happening here. <laughs> Seems good to us. Yeah, my, they might, they might, those executives might as well have been children. <laughs> Sounds fun. So as most people know, there's a, there's dinosaurs here in California at this place called Cabazon. It's on your way to Palm Springs. 
the dinosaurs feature in Pee-wee's big adventure in the scene where he's, you know, he's like out talking to, um, I forget her name, but the woman that wants to move to France. And they have this like moment inside one of the dinosaur heads in that film. So it's like this very iconic scene from the movie. After he had died, they had they had them dressed up in Pee-wee suits with the red bow tie, which was really cool. Um, and they they've kind of taken it down for Christmas. And a friend and I were saying, like, well, why can't we just blend those things? Because there is a Pee-wee's Christmas special. <laughs> So why can't, why not both? That's fair. Why can't we just continue to honor uh, Paul Rubens and also have Christmas dinosaurs? These dinosaurs mean a lot to me, to me personally. If you live like out here, it's it's a big, the dinosaurs are kind of the same. So my wife was saying that uh, he is in that quiz show movie that um, Sandro and Aquafina are in. I think it's on Hulu. And it's like one of his last uh, roles, but she said uh, he he makes the most out of it. I haven't seen it, but she says that he's pretty funny. Yeah. And I mean, it's heartbreaking to know that he was still trying to do things like that while he was sick, because I think he had been sick for for quite a while and, and struggling for quite a while. But yeah, I mean, so many great performances from from Paul Rubens, really, like he's kind of a he's kind of like the best thing about any given episode of a TV show. Um, He just makes everything better. And the fact that he gave the world this gift of this, like absolutely manic and insane and beautiful and wonderful Christmas special is like just the greatest thing. It's something that should be like preserved and like at the Smithsonian, you know, like that's how, strongly i feel about this christmas special well, i was really excited to find it not just on youtube but that they put this like super pristine version of it on, on there and i believe it had like it says it had his estate's blessing right well so i follow him on social media and, and his estate i think has continued to post after his passing and that i think was one of their big Uh, big things, big initiatives, like we're going to make this available and we're going to make it really nice knowing how beloved it is by fans and by so many people and how I think it is a tradition for um, a lot of folks to watch it. And it wasn't, you know, super commercially available for a really long time. So it's great to see it out in the world again in such a pristine condition. I think it does deserve that protection and preservation um, and for people to kind of like carry on its legacy. If for any reason you're listening to this and you haven't seen it, like, please watch it. Your life will be, your life and your holidays will be infinitely improved. <laughs> they will be better, I promise. Yeah, and I I think that a lot of people were probably trying to sell their copies on eBay and stuff after his passing. So I'm glad that they're trying to make it as <laughs> widely available for Pretty much nothing. I mean, I would pay money for it, but I'm not going to pay some random dude $50 for a DVD. Right. No, that would be no, that would be bad. I think I've had my DVD copy for a few years when I finally broke down and and they had taken it off of streaming. So I think for a brief window, it was available on one of the streaming platforms. And then it left and I had an absolute freak out. (laughs) Like, well, no, it's I need this to be available and in like, um, you know, good resolution. And I can't watch it in like 12 parts on YouTube. Yeah, I was worried that's how I was going to watch it. And then I saw like high definition and I'm like, oh, not that I need it in like the highest of definition. But, you know, I I don't want like tape hiss while I'm watching it. (laughs) No, exactly. That's exactly right. Although if somebody had like a VHS, like recorded from tv version like with the commercials from like the late 80s i would totally watch that yeah that would be fun that feels right like this is something that would feel right to watch commercials with in a weird way like commercials for cereal and oh yeah cereal that's like has no nutritional value (laughs) nothing at all as far as other uh christmas traditions like as far as like um shows or movies you know, what, what is in your rotation on a yearly basis? 
this is such a good question. Um, I we've done a podcast about it, so everybody kind of knows this. I feel like every year I try to watch Love Actually, and then I every year I realize how problematic it is. It's so like every passing year I watch it still. So what else am I gonna do? Uh, but I also hate it more. And you also watch Elf every year, right? I do watch Elf every year. I watch Elf every year. That's another kind of uh, comfort movie for me. I also try to listen to the the Phil Spector Christmas album every year. <laughs> That's kind of a, a big one in our house because it sounds really good on like vinyl. <laughs> and you just put it on and like do your Christmas things. It's fun and great, even though Phil Spector is a, a big creep. Yeah, like big bad. He was a bad man and a big creep, but it's a great Christmas album. So, and and do you have a rule for when Christmas music starts for you? Are you a after Thanksgiving person or like I know you're not like a coast. You know, you don't listen to coast for twenty four seven Christmas music. I'm guessing I don't. I don't listen to coast. Um. No, I don't. I feel like it's wrong until December 1st. So I'm very much like that, or at least until after, after Thanksgiving, like at, at least make it after Thanksgiving. And then, and then de dethaw Mariah or whatever. I mean, what do you feel like you can listen to Christmas music before Thanksgiving? No, no judgment, but judgment. Um, I, I, I think you can start on Thanksgiving, right? On Thanksgiving, but then what are you carving a turkey and then like. Well, you know, you tra- so so for me, like um, Charlie Brown Christmas is a big thing in our house. Oh, that's true. And so they just released the uh, Thanksgiving Charlie Brown, like officially, mm. like the music. And so I feel like you can tr- go from and it's a, but it's like a really short album. <laughs> so I feel like you can go from Thanksgiving into the Christmas album. Yeah. I also feel like Vince Guaraldi is good, just holiday dinner music in general. So you can totally play that across dinner parties. Yeah, like I wouldn't play Jingle Bells at Thanksgiving, but sure. I think you can start with like the Charlie Brown Christmas stuff. I think Vince Guaraldi is like a really good ramp, actually. It's like a good warm up before you get to the more like hardcore, hard drugs, intense Christmas music. So we can't be listening to Mariah Carey until the first. Mm. You, you burn out too soon. Yeah. You can't play Little St. Nick by the Beach Boys at Thanksgiving dinner. You cannot. No. I don't have a lot of respect for Thanksgiving for a variety of reasons. But I respect it enough to not do that. Yeah, I'm not a huge Christmas music person. Like now I'm subjected to it because I have children, but sure. like, as, like as an adult, it was the Sufjan like Christmas box set. And even from that, it was like, I'm not. I'd pick a couple songs from each disc. Like I don't need him playing Jingle Bells on the piano for 45 seconds on my on my normal playlist. Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings have a great Christmas album. Mm-hmm. So that... You, that's part of my rotation and um the new standards did like a live christmas album and i will we'll listen to that but because of the children it's mostly like five different christmas songs wow but i think the uh sinatra jingle bells is my favorite of the jingle bells versions yeah i i'm trying to think if i've heard that before the thing with christmas music there are there are so many iterations of the standards the the classics right and i think everybody has their favorites i guess that's kind of a kind of a good thing i also find a lot of christmas music pretty depressing (laughs) like there's there's like a half like really upbeat like really like shiny happy Christmas music. And then there's like super bummer Christmas. <laughs> there's like fairy tale of New York, you know? Right. Um, which uh, they just, um, they sang at Shane McGowan's funeral recently, which was like very affecting and pretty cool. 
Um, but yeah, there's like two, there's buckets, right? Because it's kind of like whatever, a bittersweet holiday, just like Christmas movies. Like they have like um, they usually have kind of like a bittersweet quality. Sometimes they're kind of sad. Sometimes they've got like an it's a wonderful life vibe. Yeah, I mean, even Home Alone, it's like, oh, like yeah. I miss my family. Yeah, I know that does, people don't talk about that character in Home Alone a lot. That's a really sad subplot. That's super sad. In a, like a completely ridiculous slapstick movie that you'd see, you wouldn't really expect that. Yeah, the whole time Macaulay Culkin is just judging him because he looks kind of mean. Yeah, right? He saves him at the end. Home Alone's a great movie. Great soundtrack, too. It is a great set. It's a great movie. It's a great soundtrack. Um, I love every year the way that like Home Alone discourse seems to kind of take over um, your social feeds with people wondering like whether or not Kevin McAllister's dad is a mob boss and how can he can afford like that house and, like 16 tickets to Paris. <laughs> love, love that discourse. There's like a whole Reddit thread like breaking down like how he has to be. And how he can afford all these fancy hotels in New yeah, York. It, it, it's clearly white collar crime. But uh, I mean, those are kind of like my my go for sure. I'm going to do those Christmas traditions. I don't know if you have like, what are your movies that you like for sure are going to watch? You know, you're going to watch every year. Well, because of kids, like it's more like Christmas specials instead of like two hour movies. Mm-hmm. Charlie Brown Christmas is part of it. Um, yep. The Garfield Christmas special. No, I haven't seen that in a minute. And I was thinking about it this year. Does it hold up? It holds up except for the part where he goes, whoever thought of this should be thrown out in the street and shot. <laughs> Damn Garfield. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And he says that. I believe he says it in every Garfield special. You know, I do kind of remember stuff like that, but also like we grew up in a different time, right? Like in a very like Looney Tunes kind of time where you could like make those jokes and like, right. chase around with shotguns. It was okay. It was like normal. Yeah. But, but, damn, I didn't know Garfield was that hard. Yeah. And it was just like diet soda. Whoever thought of that should be thrown down the street and shot. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a funny joke, actually. I'm like a couple of levels. This must have been like. <laughs> right when diet coke was like break it out well i don't i don't know if he made that joke specifically oh, but okay. like that, that but that's like the 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 gist of why he would say it i want to believe that that was the joke i like that like veggie burgers whoever thought of them? Yeah. anyways vegetarian lasagna yeah uh so um we we're gonna watch that this week um the grinch who stole christmas the cartoon a cartoon. We'll do that with the, uh, yeah. you know, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. Yeah, these are all like, you're like a classic Christmas family. Well, I, I'm not finding anything like new that I particularly like. Yeah, fair. Like, I'd like to move into Elf when the kids are a little bit older. Yeah, you gotta wait. Then we'll get it. Right now, it's just like, oh, this looks like an adult movie where people are just talking. Yeah, they're gonna tune that out real fast. You gotta wait. Yeah, uh, we watched this um, Sesame Street animated Nutcracker thing. Zoe kind of likes it, but I, as much as I love Sesame Street, I do not care for it. What? Well, it's Sesame Street. I mean, how good is that gonna be? Muppet Christmas Carol is superior yeah, we're gonna work our way up to that but it's it's sad you know and it also is maybe for slightly older kids in a in a weird way like because even though it has the muppets like it, it's it's a pretty dark story yeah we tried the uh the the disney like mickey mouse version of a christmas carol oh yeah um <clears throat> and i think that was a little scary it's a little intense and by the time you get to by the time you get to the ghost of like Christmas future at the end and it's basically just, you know, um, death, it's bad. That the Muppet one is like that Muppet that they crave for it is scary as shit. And uh, I I have to say that um, until uh, like high school, I didn't know that A Christmas Carol was like 
a literary classic. I just thought it was like <laughs> just a cartoon. Thought it was like, like a, you know, or, or, yeah, it was like you know, it's the uh, the Mickey Mouse or the Muppets. <laughs> But how are we supposed to know? Yeah, I was like, oh, Scrooge McDuck is Dickens? <laughs> <laughs> well, it also kind of like fits so well. Like there's such a strong character trait overlap there. Like, yeah, of course. Makes sense. Because Speaking of white collar crime. <laughs> <laughs> white feather crime. You got those bills. Swimming in the coin pit. Duck like, bills. Duck bills. I'm trying to keep um, keep things with the classics for now because I know at some point I'm not going to have any choice and it's going to be like whatever is popular OMG Girls Christmas or whatever it's called. Right. And well, that's the other thing about Christmas. There's a lot of like there's a lot of crap out there. So you really have to separate like at least if you're me, like the Hallmark movies from the stuff that's legitimately entertaining and i'm sure there's a place for that if you want to like space out and you know watch a christmas prince or whatever it is wrap your gifts like i respect it but it's not for me i just feel like you know the time at the holidays is like it's finite like you only have so much of it so you have to dedicate to the things that you know are really going to make you feel the feels yeah, I don't. I can't watch like a Christmas movie every night in December. That feels weird. I think some people do, right? Mm-hmm. Probably. Yeah, I'm sure there's people that do like. <laughs> we're gonna do Christmas movie advent calendar. Oh God! I think that's actually a- uh, Jen Howell from Every Rom Com is doing that. Oh really? That's I mean, as a as a premise for like a for a podcast or something. Like I would totally listen to her. I want to know what comes with that. I don't think I would have the stamina. (laughs) That's 25 Christmas movies. Yeah. Of varying quality. Yeah. And I don't think she's like starting with the classics. I think it's I I don't know how she's choosing them, but a lot of them I have never heard of. I I mean, I I couldn't name 25 Christmas movies. So some of them have to be like made for TV or they have to be maybe really old. Or you'd have to cheat and be like, I'm going to watch Die Hard. I mean, is Die Hard cheating, though, or is it a Christmas movie? I don't want to have this debate. I, well, I can't have the debate because I'm a, do you know what my confession is? You've never seen Die Hard? I've never seen Die Hard all the way through. I think I'm going to watch Die Hard this year, though. I think I'm going to make that commitment. I feel like at least then I'll know what people are talking about. How but many just, hot toddies? <laughs> I'm just saying it's an enhancement to that experience. I mean, I'm sure it will. I mean, you you have a couple hot toddies and you start yelling yippee ki with Bruce Willis. <laughs> Why not? Seems great. I've also never seen... This is so embarrassing. I feel like people are going to come at me for this. I've never seen The Holiday. Uh, and, and maybe it's partly... Uh, because Jack Black is a leading man is like, I don't know. It's weird to me. Like after that whole shallow howl era, it was weird to me. But but people like that movie or so I've heard. Yes, at least film Twitter seems to like it. People seem to like it. And it seems like the kind of thing that I would want to watch because it kind of involves like a cottage. I don't know. Like I like I like a Notting Hill. I like things that like involve something British. Are you like, no, it's not good. Or are you like, don't, don't do it. Um, Look at you. You're like, you got opinions. Your face is full of opinions. Well, I am, I am very picky with my, oh. my romantic movies. So that, that's part of it. The, the other part is um, it's definitely in the part of Jack Black's career where, oh, Jack Black's in this movie. So we're going to like find some place for him to sing. Oh, he sings in it? Not. Yeah, he does sing in it, and and, and and it's very shoehorned. And so he's a, I believe he's a a, a composer, like a film score composer. Okay, naturally. And so he's 
taking Kate Winslet and I forget if it's like a blockbuster. I don't know. He's talking about movies. So then he just starts like singing different like like Jaws and then he starts singing like do 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 and then and then he like he starts singing like bits of famous scores. Okay. So he's his character from High Fidelity kind of. But but not like singing walking on sunshine and <laughs> And, like uh, a less aggressive version. <laughs> yeah, like he's like kind of like nerdy, dorky, supposed to be endearing, but he's going to like sing bits of famous film scores and not a song he made up about how Laura's daddy died. <laughs> God. All right, I take it back. Maybe I won't watch The Holiday. I mean, you should, so then we can cover it for a future Christmas episode. <laughs> Okay, I'll watch the holiday. Maybe it'll become part of your your rotation. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, again, like, I don't I don't know that there's is there a good like Christmas rom com, like a really good one that's not super treacly? Because I feel like, you know, as soon as you add in a holiday, it's too much. Yeah, I can't think of any buttercream frosting you know i remember watching the family stone once and i don't remember much of it other than I oh yeah i've seen that i think craig t nelson is in it and, and claire danes i've seen the family stone but the family stone is depressing kind of like it's sort of fun but it also like has some without spoiling it for is it a spoiler if it's been out for like 20 because the mom in that film like dies of cancer I think Meryl Streep. Is it Meryl Streep? She dies of cancer. So it's sort of like there's a it's a great ensemble, but I don't know that you would watch it to like feel good at the holidays. I wouldn't. That's not for me. I think it's like basically Christmas Carol or Elf. That's about it. Yeah. And Muppets Christmas Carol, not like old British people Christmas Carol. (laughs) (laughs) Specifically the Muppets. Yeah, or Mickey Mouse. It, there should be more Muppet holiday specials. I also wish somebody would just kind of like super glue together, I don't know, a bunch of like random Christmas related performances from like 70s variety shows mm. and like the Muppet show. Like I wish somebody would do that for me so that I didn't have to do it myself. <laughs> somebody make that, please. I want that. Are we... Are we basically asking Tyler to do that for us from I turn yeah. my podcast on just like, oh my God. hey, do, the, do that uh, Batman thing with the new Batman movie, but the old Batman soundtrack, and then he did it for us? I'm just saying, like, if I had, like, you know, time um, and any, like, editing skills whatsoever, like, I would I would absolutely do that. Like, somebody needs to, like, do that. Yeah. Some, some archivist that really cares, like, needs to do that. Yes, please, because... Nicole's tech editing skills prevent her from. They're just not great. Um, but somebody should do that. It that would be really really fun, and I feel like um, it would be a gift to the world. Yeah, and I feel like the only way to make it happen is like you know for the people by the people, because it's going to be a bunch of things that are you know owned by a bunch of different media conglomerates. But I would love to see that. Like I would love to see just like a a whole kind of like spectrum of like weird little you know like. David Bowie and uh, and Bing Crosby doing Little Drummer Boy kind of moments from like across time. Because like I always want to watch that every year, but then it's like, what do I do after? It's five minutes. Yeah. yeah. I have it on vinyl. I don't even know what's on the other side. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's cool to have. I don't know. I know I've listened to it a few times and I don't know what happens when I Nicole um, it was fun talking about uh, Christmas at Pee Wee's Playhouse rest in peace Paul Rubens rest in power rest in perfection You know, it's it's funny because I, I don't remember how this came up in conversation, but you're like, oh, yeah, like I always watch Pee Wee's uh, Christmas special. And I was like, oh, I also <laughs> used to watch it all the time. And it reminded me that I should uh, go back to watching it. And I'm glad that uh, 
this year when I did watch, I watched it with with Zoe and and she seemed to really enjoy it. She's always asking to hear Feliz Navidad now. And I don't know if she quite understands why everyone's screaming at the secret word, but I think she thought it was funny. Yeah, I think that's one that you have to watch the um, the series to understand. Maybe she'll get into that. But it it was uh, nice to see that it can be part of the the family rotation. Next to Garfield and the Grinch. So we've got one more episode coming out this year, and it's going to be a Patreon exclusive. If I can figure out the technology right, we might make it so you can just buy that one episode so you can get a a preview of what we do for the Patreon. Uh, We're going to do our end of the year music list, and it seems like you're um, you're working very diligently at that. Always. I've been listening to a lot of uh, stuff that has been recommended by our podcast friends just so I can at least understand like what some of the new buzz buzz bands are. I don't like any of them, <laughs> but at least I tried. I like that the effort was made, though. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was like, oh, who's who's this Wednesday band? <laughs> they better not sound like Thursday. <laughs> And name after the first day of the week. I mean, they're okay, but not 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 at the top of my list. Well, yeah, what's your cup of tea, huh? No, I did find a song that um, I'm excited to share on my my list. That is is from a newish artist, and um, I was like, maybe maybe I'm not losing my my touch with music uh, after all. But that'll be out before December 31st. And we've got, uh, and that episode's going to contain some um, of our friends' lists as well. So we have Rachel, Rachel Brodsky. Um, so she gave us some recommendations. And Scott and Catherine from Great Song Pod, because I don't want to say the whole, <laughs> the whole podcast name. <laughs> and then I think Tara's supposed to do one as well. So it's really going to be like across the spectrum of people that have um, really good taste, like way better taste than I do. So definitely like tune in for for their recommendations. Yeah, well, I wanted to make sure that we got people that listen to new music. Right. I know. Because like it's going to be like an hour of us talking about like reissues and bands that have been around for like 30 right. years. But like exactly. It's like, oh, you do. So you don't want to talk about the uh, the give up transatlanticism tour. Oh. No, we yeah, did new music. Yeah, new music. New <laughs> music. I mean, we'll still talk about some old music, but but I hope you're looking forward to that. Nicole and I are definitely looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to this year being over. But then a new year has to start, and you don't know what's going to happen then. Yeah. I'm not exactly looking forward to a new year. I'm just looking forward to this one being over. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm counting down the days that I have to actually be in the office for the rest of 2023. Same. The number is two. Big, big same. Uh, well, here's to um, a lot of really uh, great holiday naps. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Soundtrack Your Life. Make sure to visit our website, SoundtrackYourLife.net, where you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too.